Good morning. Grace and peace for Lord Jesus Christ be with each of you. It's great to see you on this beautiful fall morning, and it's good to have our Break of Bonds guys with us. Welcome, fellas. Thanks for getting up early. I already warned them that uh, I only do one sermon a week, and uh, they're going to hear it again at 1030. <laughs> but it's like a wine. It gets better over time. So. <laughs> so if you're a guest and visitor with us this morning, please... Uh, well, first of all, welcome, and please fill out a Connect card. You'll find them in the pews right in, in front of you in one of those little, uh, little pocket things. You can fill it out and, uh, and put it in the offering plate when that time comes, and that's just a way for us to connect and, uh, and to officially welcome you into our worship service. Now, today we're going to start our, our annual three-week generosity campaign, and this is something that, that we've done every year since I've been here, and probably every church in this hemisphere, every Christian church anyway, this time of year, has some sort of a stewardship or generosity campaign, and we're really no different. And just so you know, uh, the reason churches tend to do it this time of year, do it in the fall, you know, late October, early November, um, is because this is the time of year when churches start putting together the budget for the next year. And that's exactly what we have looming in our future, near future. Um, as we start putting together the budget for our, our ministry budget for the following year. So for the next three weeks, that, that will kind of be the focus of what we talk about. But the thing is, I've, I've noticed, and now I'm in my sixth year here, um, you all don't need anybody preaching to you about generosity. I mean, you've proven that time and time again with our MOVE campaign, and, and, and we are doing great. You get the generosity thing. Um, so although that's the the... What we're kind of leading up to with the next three weeks, you know, you got your your, um, your, your pledge cards in the mail. You should have gotten them. We know we got them at our house. Um, if you haven't, you'll get them Monday um, with the letter, and, and we'll fill those prayerfully, kind of consider what you want to give for the next year. This isn't move money. This is this is for our, our regular operating budget. Um, but consider that, and then on the first weekend in November, I think it's the 4th and 5th, I think that's right, um, well, as an act of worship, you know, we'll, we'll go ahead and you can submit your your, uh, your pledge cards. Now, if you want to, if you're going to be gone that weekend or whatever, or if you want to turn it in early, you're welcome to drop it in the offering plate today or next week or run it by the church office. That's fine, too. But it's very helpful for us to, to kind of know as we put a budget together, know, we know what our expenses are, but we don't know what we're going to have coming in. And that's how we plan next year's ministry. And we've got a lot of things planned for next year. So um, we need to know where we stand. So that's what that's all about. And uh, last week, I had the opportunity to go and, and preach at Great United Methodist Church in Cape Girardeau. And they were in the midst of their campaign, and, and Pastor Linda asked me to come and speak. And I did uh, last week um, on week two of their three-week campaign. And so uh, that was a great opportunity. I'll talk more about that during our, during our sermon. So that's what's in the future for us for this week and the next two weeks. Uh, I also want to give you an update on our renovations. Um, you remember how this place kind of looked like a train wreck for months, and we didn't have, couldn't have worship here, obviously. Well, that's kind of how the downstairs looks right now. It uh, looks like a bomb exploded in the kitchen and in the fellowship hall, uh, all in the name of progress. Um, so last week, and I don't remember what day it was, but our general contractor came in, and they had all the subcontractors, all the electrician and the painter guys, the flooring guys, all these people. So there's five or six of them that were with the general contractor, and we walked through the building again and with our list of things we wanted to have done that the council and others had come up with, walked through again so that everybody was on the same page, and they, we are moving forward with everything else that's going to be done, and we'll finish out this, this, at least the high street part of this renovation. I wish I could tell you that it'd be done by whatever date. I don't have any idea how long this stuff takes, um, but it's going to be several months of, of not in here, but everywhere out there of, of us moving stuff from one room to another because their painters are working in this area. It's just going to be a big shell game, and it makes me nervous to even talk about it because <laughs> we have a lot of stuff. Um, and you never know how much stuff you have until you start to move it. So we have a lot of stuff. So that's what will be going on. But we are making progress. 
we kind of hit a hiccup a little bit, to be honest with you. They were working on the kitchen, and then we had to do, we decided we wanted to, to change the way we were doing the stove and the oven, and, um, and that required new building permits, and so that kind of, I mean, it's a good thing we did. I'm glad we, we made those changes, but it did cost us some time waiting on the permits and, and those sorts of things. But now we're back underway, and we even had a, a funeral here on Friday, Millie Rose's funeral, which is, by the way, where those flowers came from. And they were down there working during the funeral. They were working very quietly, but they were, they were steady working all afternoon on Friday, even during that. So, so that's what's going on. It'll be a while before we can get into our kitchen and fellowship hall, but once we get in there, it's going to be nice. It's going to be nice. Um, the SEMO Food Bank, um, Mary's not here. Well, she is here. She's everywhere. But, but um, <laughs> since I know she's listening, uh, 8.15... Monday morning, the bus leaves for the SEMO Food Bank. And also the last announcement I have is our youth group, kind of our re-engineered, revamped youth group. I guess that's what we're going to call it. We thought of a better name for it yet. Not yet. We'll work on it. But youth group, yeah, that's not very catchy. A youth group begins on Wednesday, um, November the 1st, and that's through 6th through 12th grade. So... Colby Rushing's involved in that, and obviously Paige and, and some others. Brenda's working on it, too. So we'll kick that off November the 1st. Okay? I think that's all the announcements I have. Um, so please stand for our opening intro, our opening prayer, and opening song. Father, we thank you for this beautiful morning and for the privilege it's ours to share it together. We invoke your blessings of guidance upon all we do in the name of our Lord. You will bless us and give us strength, give us guidance, and help us to make this message of love and care to all people. In the spirit of Christ, we pray. Amen. Turn down your hymnal to hymn number 540. 45 standing together and sing standing one, three, four, and five. <laughs>
Miss Mary Harriet. I'm going to wave at her. I recognize her. Find someone that you know. Oh, hi. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to wave at the people I recognize. Well, our scripture today is actually about Jesus talking to his disciples about if people recognized him or not. And some people did, and some people didn't. So, first, before we even get started here, I'm going to show you some things and see if you recognize them, okay? Um, what do you think this thing might be? Maybe a CD? <laughs> like a Walkman? Okay. Any other ideas of what this might Yeah, what do you think? Like cards? Okay. Well, this is a Nintendo game <laughs> um, from back in the uh, 80s, 1985 actually. So I know they're tiny now. It, it doesn't look anything like this, right? In fact, you can buy some of your Nintendo games and stuff online, right? I know. I'm old. But you didn't recognize that, right? You kind of had an idea, but you didn't quite recognize that. What about this? What do you think? A CD. A CD? A DVD? Yeah, yeah, so, it uh, tastes like chicken, mm, okay. Um, so it's a tape thing, a tape thing, yes. In fact, back in the ancient times, um, we used to watch movies on this, and if the movies were too long, we had two of these. We had to take the other one out and put another one in to finish watching the movie. And we even had to go to the store and rent these because you couldn't just get them on TV like you can now. You had to rewind them. Yeah, you had to rewind them too. Yeah, this one's rewound, thank thankfully, but yeah. Isn't that crazy? Okay, now, this one too. What do you think might be in here? Clothes. It, it kind of looks like a suitcase. A VCR is what that's called. But yeah, you don't, you don't put a tape in there. Yeah, no. But you're, it kind of looks like that. It's kind of the same shape. Yeah, okay. It looks like a briefcase. Okay, I'm going to open it and see if this gives you any more hints. A CD. Oh, what is it? Oh, Wesley recognized it. It's a record player, you all. I asked my husband for this for my birthday a couple years ago because I love the way a record sounds, and I jam out in my house to my record player. It's fantastic. It just kind of crackles a little bit. It's wonderful. It doesn't sound like the newfangled stuff, okay? <laughs> Oh, really? Like a suitcase for Barbie? That's all. Awesome. <laughs> well, I'll tell you something. Sometimes we recognize things and sometimes we don't, okay? And like I was saying earlier, um, Jesus' disciples were talking to people about whether or not they recognized who Jesus was. And some people said that Jesus was a prophet, and some people said that he was like a really good preacher and all of those things, but there was this one disciple. His name was Peter. He was kind of ornery. And anyway, Peter says, you, you know Peter? I have a book about that too. That's awesome. Teamwork. Me too. I think we all do, don't we? Have a book about Jesus? Well, guess what? Not everybody had a book about Jesus, so not everybody recognized him. But Peter did it. And when Peter said that, Jesus, I know who you are. You're the son of God. You're our savior. You came here to make sure that we love people and take care of others and that we're saved from the things that we kind of make crazy mistakes about. So Jesus was like, you're right, Peter. And he called him the rock. Okay. Not like the rock from the movies with the big muscles, but like the rock <laughs> of the church because Peter knew who Jesus was. And Peter was willing to tell other people who Jesus was too. So he called him the rock because a rock is a strong foundation or a strong building material, okay? So 
you guys know who Jesus is, right? So guess what? I bet Jesus would call you guys The Rock, too. Would you like that nickname? No? How about you? Yeah, muscles. Muscles for days, right? So you guys would be the rock of the church, too, because you would help be Jesus' foundation of the church because you know who Jesus is. So, yeah, you'd be totally strong. 40, 70 houses. You're right. You're right. So it's important for us to be strong in our faith and strong in knowing who Jesus is and telling other people about it. So that's why it's so important to be the rock, okay? So you can tell other people and give them a firm foundation in their faith, all right? So when you don't recognize Jesus in the world, maybe he looks a little different, okay? Or you know somebody who doesn't recognize Jesus, it's your job as a person of faith and a rock of the church to tell them who Jesus is, right? All right, let's pray together. Dear God, God, thank you you for revealing yourself yourself through Jesus. Jesus. We know that Jesus Jesus is our Savior. Savior. Help us to remember that that. and and tell others. Thank you for your love. Jesus name. Jesus name. Amen. Amen. All right. So part of the important part of being a rock is you need to be strong and you know, you need some sugar to be strong, but you also, um, I gave you more than one piece of candy and this is why, because part of you being the rock is sharing Jesus with others, right? So I need you to share some of your candy with someone else. So I know, I know, I know that's tough. But you can do it. I have faith in you. So enjoy sharing your candy with others and being the rock and sharing God's love. Uh, The scripture reading today is Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 19. This is Peter's declaration about Jesus. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Then he asked them, But who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, You are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock, and upon this rock I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven, and whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. This is the word of God for the people of God.
Thank you, choir. Like I said, it's good to be back. It's good to be back. Uh, it was inter- it's always interesting when you have the opportunity to go preach at another, at another church. And um, as, as the lead here, I, don't, I, I used to do it quite a bit. You know, when you're first starting out in ministry, before you're appointed at a church, many times you'll, you'll be a pulpit fill guy, they call it. And it's somebody that the DS calls up and says, hey, so-and-so is going to be on vacation for a couple weeks. Can you go to his church and, and cover for him? So when you're brand new and what you do is what I advise the people I'm entering to do anyway, but I did, I write two or three sermons and I really try to hone them and I recycle them. <laughs> These people haven't heard them before. I'm kind of doing that this morning a little bit. Because when I wrote this sermon, I was, I was preparing for our three-week generosity campaign and they were in the middle of their generosity campaign. I was preaching there, so I so, said, well, it's, it applies to both churches. But as I got to working on it, and as, as, especially as I was delivering this sermon last week at Grace, while what I'm talking about is true and applies to this text that, that Stan read to us, it really has a different contextual meaning for us than it does them. And I want to bring that into to focus toward the end of the sermon. I also want to apologize to Brenda and Todd and Julie if they're here because they're going to have heard this for the third time now. I guess Todd and Julie aren't here, but Brenda's heard it before from last week. So let's get into the text that Stan just read to us. You know, opinions may vary on this, but for my money, this is one of the most pivotal um, and one of the most dramatic exchanges in all of the Gospels, this exchange between Peter and his disciples, or specifically the exchange between um, between Jesus and his disciples, and specifically the exchange between Jesus and Simon. Now, I know that's a pretty bold statement to say this is the most one of the most pivotal and one of the most dramatic statements in all the Gospels, but, but there's a lot of important stuff going on here in this text. If you think about it, in just a few short verses, Jesus asks the twelve, he asks them a question. And Simon answers the question, but he answers it with, in effect, a a personal profession of faith. And then Jesus responds to Simon's personal profession of faith by changing Simon's name to Peter. Who does that? And then in the same breath, Jesus breaks out the word church for the first time. This is the first time the word church is mentioned in the Gospels, and it's mentioned by Jesus right here in Matthew chapter 16. And then in a single sentence, Jesus tells us what the church is, tells us who's building the church, tells us who owns the church, and then Jesus gives us some insight into the eternal power and the eternal purpose of the church. Now, it doesn't take a theologian to pick up on the fact that what's going on here in this text has some pretty far-reaching ramifications. Just think about it. We're a church family, worshiping here in this beautiful church building. As a result, at least in part, as a result of Jesus and Peter's long ago, faraway conversation. But with that said, that's not what makes this day in the life of, of Peter and the guy, or of Jesus and the guys, that's not what makes it so dramatic. That's not what makes it so pivotal. What makes it dramatic is where this conversation takes place, and what makes it so pivotal is when this conversation takes place. So let's start with the when. At this point, Jesus is about two-thirds of the way through his three-year ministry. And although the 12 disciples were probably oblivious, Jesus knew that his earthly ministry was rapidly coming to an end. In other words, it was crunch time. Jesus had been pouring in to his 12 closest followers 24-7 for the better part of two years. And now he needed to know if there were any among them who understood who he was, who understood who sent him, and understood why he was sent. Or put differently, did the men who, who knew Jesus best, did they truly recognize him? for who he truly was. Would any of them 
be able to carry on the mission when his earthly ministry had ended. That is what was at stake in this conversation. Jesus' who do you say that I am question is a crucial question, and it needed an answer. If just a few, if even just one, understood who he was and what he had come to do, then his work would be safe. The good news mission could continue. So with all that at stake, at the pivotal two-thirds point in his ministry, Jesus gives them a pop quiz. Who do you say that I am? That's the pivotal significance of this conversation. The pivotal win of this conversation. But what makes this conversation so dramatic is where this conversation takes place. Jesus didn't take the 12 to some secluded, out-of-the-way place in Palestine to have this conversation. He didn't gather, around some, gather them around some cozy campfire at the end of a long day of ministry. No, Jesus took the 12 to a place that they had never been before. He took them to Caesarea Philippi, this big city that's about 25 miles north of the Sea of Galilee. And compared to what these salt of the earth Jewish men were used to, Jesus might as well have taken them to another planet. Because Caesarea Philippi, it was a, it was a modern, progressive, metropolitan area that was, that was bustling with, with commerce. And it was also an extremely religious city. And the people of Caesarea Philippi, they prided themselves on their open-minded acceptance of, of many different religious beliefs, many different worldviews, many different religious practices. In Caesarea Philippi, there were the, the Syrian Baal worshippers, there was the Greek Pan worshippers, and then, not to be outdone, the Romans worshipped Caesar in this huge marble temple that just dominated the Caesarean Philippi landscape. It, it loomed high above the city and looked down upon the city. And the city's progressive population had welcomed all of them, all those different worldviews and schools of thought and religion, all except Judaism, that is. So with that in mind, isn't it, isn't it more than a little ironic that in a cave beneath one of the mountains overlooking Caesarea Philippi flows a spring, a spring which is the headwater, the source of the Jordan River, the river that flows so prominently throughout the history of the Jewish faith. Now, I seriously doubt if the, if the citizens of that city had any idea that that spring fed the Jordan River, and the Jordan River played such a prominent role in the Jewish faith. And I'm pretty sure that the days to confuse 12 disciples had no idea that that was the case. But I think Jesus knew, and I'll bet that was at least part of why he took them there. So just picture the scene. Here's Jesus, a penniless, homeless, Galilean carpenter, traveling with 12 unremarkable men to a place that, that might as well have been the planet Jupiter. And there, surrounded by the sea of pagan temples, Jesus asked them, who do you say that I am? Now remember, it's crunch time. Time's running out. Jesus needs at least one of them to get it right. So what does Jesus do? Demanding an answer, he places himself amid all the dominant worldviews of the day. He corners them and forces them to commit. Who do you say that I am? Well, thankfully, Simon, soon to be Peter, he nailed it. He's the only one, but evidently it only, it only took one. Jesus asked, who do you say that I am? And, and Simon answered, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus affirms his answer by saying, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because you ate the pop quiz by cheating. It's not exactly what it said, but <laughs> it does in my Bible. But that's kind of the implication. Peter didn't make this profession of faith based on his own insight and intellect. You know, Peter was a lot of things, but I don't think intellectual was one of them. <laughs> Peter professed only what the Father had revealed to him. The Father had revealed 
to Peter that Jesus is the one. He's the long-awaited Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, you got the right affirmation. It continues, he says, and I tell you that you are Peter, which means rock. And on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. <laughs> Isn't it amazing that, that Jesus says more about the church in just one sentence than, than a thousand how-to-do church books do combined? And here's what I mean by that. Evidently, Jesus is the one who built the church. Jesus didn't say, on this rock, you will build my church. He said, on this rock, I will build my church. And what a relief that ought to be to us. Because whatever we humans build, no matter how magnificent it may be, it always ends up being perishable, inferior, and finite. What God sent his son to build is, by definition, eternal. Jesus also points out that, that he is the one who owns the church. He didn't say, on this rock, I will build your church. He said, on this rock, I will build my church. And again, that should be a huge relief to all of us. If Jesus is the builder, and if Jesus is the owner, then the church will be fruitful. It will be eternal. And it will be life-giving. And then just to drive the point home, Jesus says that the gates of hell will not overcome it. The gates of hell will not overcome it. I've always wondered, is this statement, the gates of hell will not overcome it, is that statement a warning or a promise? Think about that. Is it a warning that the church is going to face some pretty hellish op opposition? Or is it a promise that no matter what the church faces, the church will ultimately prevail. Actually, it's probably both. Probably both a, a, war, a promise and a warning. As for the warning part, for example, have you ever noticed that our church family, have you ever noticed that, that when we're allowing Jesus to be our church's builder and our church's owner and operator, in other words, when we're doing church right, have you ever noticed that, that we always end up running headfirst into some sort of opposition? I mean, it happens in our personal lives, too, but, but certainly in our church life, and maybe I, and, you know, I'm here all the time, maybe I notice it more than others, but, but it's true. I mean, everything's going right. We've got a mission, everything, the money's good, everything's going great. And then out of nowhere, one of those big old expensive HVAC units at South Campus decides to, to retire. And we got to replace it for $30,000. Just out of nowhere, opposition. It threatens to derail us. But we get everything going right. We got a mission. We're going to start a new ministry, whatever. But we got these kind of, every once in a while, these, these naysayers kind of nipping at our heels. Well, we've never done it that way. We've never done that. We can't do that. We don't. Or we got everything going right. We're moving headstrong and got great ministry and we're growing. And some external factor, something we have no control over whatsoever, just pops up. I don't know, something like a global pandemic. <laughs> That's opposition. Or we have this, the church decides to lose its mind and we'll start disaffiliating. You know, I think Jesus is giving us a heads up warning that that's kind of what's to be expected in the church. And what's more, this isn't the only place that Jesus gives us a warning of this nature. Speaking of himself, in John chapter 3, Jesus says, God's light came into the world, but people love the darkness more than they love the light, for their actions were evil. So as people called to reflect, as a church that's called to reflect God's light, that sounds a lot like the makings of opposition. And then later on in John 15, Jesus states it even more directly. It was in his last, one of his last conversations with his disciples. They're in the upper room. It's the last night before he's arrested. And Jesus says to them, you know, if the world hates you, remember it hated me first. The world would love you as one of its own if you belong to it, but you're no longer part of the world. 
I chose you to come out of the world. The world hates you. That's opposition. And you know, those two verses from John's Gospel, of course, when I think when Jesus said them, he was referring to, to more of our, our personal, our individual walk as disciples, what we can expect. But why would we expect that to be any different for the church? The church, which after all, it's a collection or a, a community of individual believers. Therefore, perhaps one of the marks of a growing church might just be the opposition it receives. You know, I once heard a, a seasoned pastor, it wasn't Jimmy or Charles, but it, uh, <laughs> tell me one time, it says, if you, if you wake up in the morning and you don't run into the enemy head on, then maybe you're going in the wrong direction. Pretty good advice. Look good on a bumper sticker if it was a really big bumper on the car. <laughs> but maybe that's kind of what Jesus meant with his gates of hell warning. But on the other hand, the good news promise is that Jesus is building his church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. You know, the New Living Translation, which is what Stan read from, the New Living Translation uses that word hell. And other translations tend to use the word Hades. Now, while hell might be more impactful for us English speakers, you know, it kind of has a punch to it. Hades is probably the more accurate word. Hades means the abode of the dead. That's what that word means. Therefore, what Jesus is saying is that sin's death is powerless against the power of the church. But nonetheless, this death, sin's death, it, it is a reality, right? That we have to deal with. And it's a and death, sin's death, is the enemy of our life. And what's more, it's a powerful enemy. It's a powerful enemy who, who knows our fears and worse yet knows how to leverage our fears. It was sin's death that invaded the Garden of Eden and took down Adam and Eve. And it's been trying to take the rest of us down ever since. Therefore, the church, to some extent, has become a place of, of refuge for believers. A safe place in which the enemy is, is powerless to penetrate. And that, of course, is kind of a, a defensive perspective of the church, isn't it? Kind of like the church is a kind of impenetrable, protective vault that keeps us safe from all the world's death-dealing bad stuff out there. And I suppose that's, that's kind of true. I mean, after all, we call this place a sanctuary, right? But I don't think that's the whole truth at all. When Jesus said, the gates of hell cannot overcome the church. Which gates was Jesus referring to? Was he talking about the church gate? Or was he talking about hell's gate? Is Jesus saying that hell won't have the power to break through the church's gate? I don't think so. I think what Jesus was saying here is that hell's gates will be powerless against the power of the church. Jesus isn't building a defensive church. Jesus is building an offensive church. A church that has no reason to fear death because through Jesus, it's already won. Death has already been defeated. Why would we play defense against an enemy who has no power to defeat us? Jesus is building a church that will go on the offense and break down death's gate and rescue those who are spiritually dead. And isn't that exactly what Jesus did in his three-year ministry? You know, Jesus didn't go and spend three years locked in the sanctuary of Jerusalem's temple. Jesus went out into the dark places. And he hung out with the tax collectors. He hung out with the lepers. And he hung out with the, the down and outers and the sinners. He hung out with the people that weren't allowed in Jerusalem's temple. Jesus fearlessly broke down the gates of their hell with his fearless light and love. And that's evidently what Jesus is calling the church. That's what he's calling this church to do. And to do so fearlessly, knowing that the gates of hell are no match for Christ's church. 
And, you know, I think that, I think this church gets that. I think we truly get that. I mean, I can't think of, of a darker, and, and the gentleman here will probably vouch for this, a darker place to be than in the world of addiction. And we just go and we punch that darkness in the nose. We don't know anything about it. We just punch it in the nose. And we welcome, and we take that light into those dark places. And we welcome the lost to come and be found in Christ's church. That's not us playing defense. That's us playing offense. That's what the church is supposed to do. And I don't know that we were smart enough to figure out that we were doing that when we did it. But that was the result. That was just being faithful and saying yes. I didn't know what we were doing. Probably still don't. And it's the same thing with other ministries. We got, you know, we're launching this, this new ministry. It's in its very infant stages, but we want to get and get involved in the this border immigration ministry. Now it doesn't matter what your politics are on this whole border crisis thing, it doesn't matter at all. Because at the end of the day, we have real people crossing the border that are homeless. They need to be loved. They need help. That's not about politics. That's just helping people. And the reason we do that is because they're lost. And it's, just, it's just Christian hospitality to welcome them, however they got here. And do so simply because each one of them has a name. Each one of them was individually created by God. And God knows their name. And so should we. That's why we go help in those dark places. We have other ministries that, that we're not allowed to go to anymore, like our Haiti ministry. So what do we do? We can't go there. And it's sad. But we can still support it in the best way we can. And right now, it's simply financially. And our Go Team ministry, which flood buckets and all those things that seem kind of mundane until you the victim of a tornado or a flood, then they come in kind of handy. And it's nice to have people that have thought ahead that can take it into their, that individual's hell and share with them God's life. Now, there's another mention of our church. You know, we are we're doing pretty well. God, and it's nothing to do with me or any of us. God has blessed us with, with the ability to, to reach out and do ministry. And that kind of it's become a habit for us. It's become natural. But it's also weird. <laughs> There's not many churches that are able to do that right now. There's not many churches with all this, at least Methodist churches, with all this disaffiliation stuff going on that have the resources to do it. They've kind of, many churches have kind of gone into this defensive mode. Let's just stay alive. Let's just stay alive. I've forgotten how to be an offensive church. So part of the mission that we have is and the responsibility we have is to work with those churches. And that's why I went to Grace last week. And that's why I preached this sermon. So part of our mission as a larger church in this area, and somehow we're it. We're bigger than all the rest of them around here, at least the Methodist churches. It's not like being the tall, tallest midget. But anyway, <laughs> we're, we're it. But our responsibility then is to share with those other churches and to help them they're not if they're struggling with doing ministry and kind of stuck in this defensive mode what can we do we can just include them in our ministry so that's why we've got grace united methodist church getting involved in our border ministry as that thing spins up that's why we're including them in our in our go team and, and the flood bucket stuff and just to get them in, involved in ministry until they get traction and they can do it that's the responsibility we have the privilege of being a, a very outgoing church. Therefore, we have this responsibility to help others be the same way. That's what it means to be an offensive church. And that's what Jesus meant, I think, when he said the gates of hell will not stop his church. That's the church we're called to be. Amen. Now, in response to God's word, let's uh, stand and sing where charity and love prevail. We'll sing verses 1, 3, 4, and 6.
seated. The pastors talked to us about being an offensive church. And when we reach out beyond the walls of this building, we include the masses of people that have never confessed Christ as Lord and Savior. So it's our responsibility to share the good news that Jesus Christ is Lord. While we're doing that, there are those among us who are going through difficult times. And you see a list of names on the back side of the order of service of individuals who have requested prayer. And if anything we do helps us to reach beyond these walls to encourage us, it's prayer. We do not go alone. We go along with the presence of a God who promises never to leave us nor forsake us. So please notice the prayer list. Today we remember Don and Ann Mowry and the passing of their daughter. We remember Claude Rose and the passing of Millie and the family there, along with many other names that are on that list. Take time to peruse through that list, and I trust you'll spend just a moment and reflect upon each individual and ask God for guidance. Ask God for leadership. Ask God for healing. Ask God for comfort and hope. With that in mind, let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of prayer. As we gather in this place today, we recognize how much we are indeed our sister and our brother's keeper. We recognize that when one of our members suffers, we all suffer. And we recognize when one member rejoices, we all join in the Jubilee. So today we come humbly before you, placing the names of these, our brothers and sisters in Christ, those who lost loved ones, those who are going through dark valleys, those who are seeking comfort, those who are seeking healing, those who are seeking direction for their lives. Lord, there's many needs among us. So we pray for one another that your will will be done. Give direction. Give leadership as we seek out those needs. Not only do we pray for one another gathered here in the names of those on our prayer list, but today we also pray for those worldwide, our Christians and brothers, who are going through difficult times. Many of our brothers and sisters are being severely persecuted, even to death, because they confess Christ as Savior. So we know that as we profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that's an awesome responsibility. But we're not promised to walk this walk alone. We're promised to be with us, and we trust you for that promise today. For we ask for guidance, and as we share this message of hope that our pastor shared with us, make us mindful and aware that we are indeed responsible for those beyond us. It's in that spirit we lift our voices together, praying the prayer you taught us to pray, pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, and we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now as our ushers come forward, let's prepare to give back to God some of our first and our best with our gifts, tithes, and offerings.
Father God, thank you for giving us the opportunity to give. And Lord, we, we give out of our abundance, but we do so in faith, knowing that you will receive these gifts. You will magnify them and multiply them. You will take these gifts and make them light and love in someone else's life. Lord, thank you for inviting us to participate in your kingdom-building work. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please remain standing for our closing hymn, which is, My Hope is Built. We'll sing the first and last verse. It's number 368. <laughs> standing on the promise of a God who promises to be with us regardless of the circumstances. That's a powerful thought, and I trust as you leave here, you'll remember you're never alone in the process of reaching beyond the walls of your life and the walls of this building. I go in peace, and may the blessing of the Lord be your strength and guide today and always. And all of God's people together said, Amen. Amen. Have a wonderful day. Welcome for fellowship in the other time.